So yes, I will talk about data.gov.uk, but I do not directly work on it. I just want to make that clear at the outset. So open data standards and engagement. So during this presentation, I'm going to be covering a few things. So a bit of context and background on open data and transparency. A brief look at the cast list for this meeting would suggest that most of you probably know this stuff, so I won't dwell too much on it. Um, the current thinking I'm going to talk about and the plan as we've trailed in the national data strategy, which I'm sure you've all seen. Um, I'm going to talk about some work that we're doing on standards through the Data Standards Authority, uh, which will hopefully improve the quality of data that we publish openly and hopefully answer some of the questions actually that I've seen in the chat around how do we kind of look at quality of data. And then finally, I'm going to touch on some approaches that we're taking in delivering the work. Um, so I think it's really important to talk about the how as much as the what. So uh, without further ado, um, as we know, open data and transparency since around 2010, the emergence of the open data kind of theme, uh, the UK has tried to be at the forefront internationally. I think there was a time when that was true. Um, and through a number of initiatives that we've already mentioned, things like data.gov.uk, the Open Government Partnership uh, work that we've been doing on national action plans, and a number of kind of sector specific uh, pieces of work, such as the geospatial work that we've already referen uh, referenced. I think, you know, we've tried to tr uh, keep pace uh, with the kind of international uh, open data and transparency movement. Um, the, the environment that we've created to enable open data and transparency, obviously we have the licensing side of things, so we have the OGL, the Open Government Licence, that's what we publish most of our open data, you know, all of our open, truly open data is published under this licence for unlimited reuse, and we publish it onto data.gov.uk as we've already mentioned, so you know, just a bit of an update on data.gov.uk, it has over 46,000 data sets as I'm sure you're all aware, it's the primary platform to connect with open data. It's not a hosting site, it's an extensive library of links to other sites. Um, and it's been in, in action since around January 2010. And we think that around 400 apps have been created using data that people have pulled from data.gov.uk. So uh, a few quick examples of some recent open data bits of work that we've done. So first, grants data. So this is a, something that we've been pushing for on the open government policy for a while now. Um, you know, publishing the amount of money that government grants to uh, organizations like charities is really crucial for public transparency and oversight. But it also allows really important insights to be kind of drawn about the kinds of projects that are selected for funding, the types of organizations that are being awarded public money, and then like the onwards evaluation of grants uh, in terms of the value for money for the taxpayer as well. So we're always working to improve the quality of data. And recently we were able to publish 32 billion pounds worth, that's the 2018 to 19 grants data at the, into the 360 giving standard, which is the kind of, I guess, the kind of the, the industry standard for, for grants data that's out there. So that's been a big win for us. Secondly, I wanted to kind of flag this, this thing called the Casey project. This is something that's done uh, with procurement data. So what this does, it uses open data that we publish on Contracts Finder back within government. So it's a good way of kind of showcasing how open data is not just about people creating apps and innovative uh, you know, solutions out there in the wild, but it's also about government using its own open data in ways that inform decision making. I think that's a really important thing that we're trying to increase as much as possible. And then finally, open data communities, you know, it's been happening for a while. Uh, MHCLG have had this project that they've been looking at data that's published on the local level and using all kinds of different approaches like visualizations, you know, really handy narratives to go along with the data. And it really helps non-experts gain value from that data that's being put out there. So as with the Casey project, it's all about, you know, dashboarding, things being used for kind of uh, internal use as well as external use. So I just wanted to draw out those three examples of, of good examples of, of case studies with open data. But really, we're kind of at this point now where we're looking to transform the way that government uses and shares data, right? So we've we've, we've done the open data uh, and we're still looking to try and improve things, but we have a wider vision that data, kind of open data sits within this wider vision for data that I want to talk a bit about. So um, first of all, you know, the recently published national data strategy, as I mentioned earlier, kind of talks a lot about the work that we're trying to do. The core mission for us is around transforming government's use of data to drive efficiency and improve public services. So that means transforming the way data is used and shared across government and also helping to deliver joined up trusted public services and ultimately improve policy making as well. Here are some of the verticals. So, you know, we want to build a truly joined up and interoperable data ecosystem within government. That'll improve the way that we collect, use and share data. It'll also benefit citizens and government by providing these tailored services increasing the efficiencies that we see in government and saving taxpayer money and also improve policy and operational decision making. Those are the kind of main areas, main bits of work and also the kind of main benefits we expect them to deliver. 
So there are challenges, always there are challenges. The challenges we see are around things like government collecting and managing lots of data, but not always using them and sharing them very well. And there's a number of factors that play into this space. So first of all, you know, the lack of common data standards is a big issue. And, and the question around quality that I see in, chat, in the chat earlier really speaks to this point around standards. You know, we need to think about this. Data infrastructure that we use isn't always interoperable. Legal and cultural barriers exist that prevent data sharing. And there's inconsistent data capability within our workforce as well. So there are different levels of comfort with data from kind of the, the basic kind of policymaker, as I would consider myself to be, all the way up to the kind of data scientist. We need a baseline of, of standards and a baseline of skill that we're, we're happy with. So these issues are not new, uh, nor is the desire to change them. And numerous external reviews like the NAO review, the PAC and more have highlighted these challenges and made the case for change. So we have a plan. Our plan is that we've identified five key areas that we want to try and change. So first is around quality, availability and access. Second, standards and enforcement. Third, capability, leadership and culture around data. Fourth is accountability and productivity. And last but by no means least, the ethics and public trust element, which I think is crucial. So I'm going to talk a bit about each of these in turn. First of all, quality, availability and access. So what we want to try and create is consistently high quality data. So we want a clear understanding of what data is held by various departments. We want a better idea of data collection standards. and We want an efficient way of data sharing as well. So what we're doing around this is we are driving use of data sharing legislation. We have the Digital Economy Act that came in in 2017. We're trying to drive more use of that as, a, as, a, as a, the, uh, the premium, you know, um, I guess the, the default way of doing data sharing. We're campaigning on the benefits of data use, trying to get the good news stories out there. And we're also creating data inventories across, across government. Secondly, really importantly, standards and enforcement. So we want to we be setting, driving the adoption of data standards. We want to lead to greater consistency. We want better integrity and we want interoperability and data to be used and shared effectively. So we have the Data Standards Authority that we established last year, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in detail shortly. And we're also linking data standards to spend controls. So there's actually a, a hard edge to this. It's not just about best practice. There's actually a, a lever to make sure that people are complying. Thirdly, capability, leadership and culture, really important. So we want to be able to develop a world leading data capability within government. So we want to upskill our leadership and drive mature data culture across government. So this is all about driving the DDAT, that's digital data and technology skills across the function. We have the government data science partnership pumping out more and more highly skilled data scientists every year. And we also have training for specialists and leaders. So again, it's all about that base level all the way up to specialist. We want to be moving the whole skill set up as much as possible. Uh, accountability and productivity. So we, we need to strengthen leadership on data and we need to hold departments to account for delivering progress and benefits. So we have new governance structures that we're looking to introduce and new leadership with renewed kind of interest in this space. And we again are looking to leverage spend controls to make sure there are actual genuine levers to, to enact change. And finally, the how, the ethics and public trust. So the use of data needs to take place within a framework of transparency, safeguards and assurance. Open data is a huge part of this piece. It needs to build and maintain public trust. So we have the data ethics framework. We have new transparency measures that we're looking to bring in. And we also want to renew our commitment to open data and look again for more and more data sets that are salient and useful to release as open data across the government estate. So there's a big opportunity with data, as we know, uh, you know, the, the government's been trying to improve its delivery of digital services for a long time. GDS has been around since 2011 to try and transform the provision of online public services and make government digital by default. There have been some major successes, things like gov.uk. Um, but now we need to look at, you know, these these other challenges and, and try and try and address them. So the data opportunity as we see it is, is about this. So, you know, there's a huge amount of data out there. We feel that data matters. That's why government's in the process of consulting on the national data strategy. And the pandemic has actually really focused minds on this. And it's provided a clear message about the importance of data around understanding a problem and coordinating efforts across borders to protect lives, jobs, and, and all those things. So as I say, the national data strategy mission three is all about the need for government to transform its approach. Uh, and this is kind of where we where we come with this, this, this vision around you know, trying to improve the delivery of digital services. And this is kind of what we're talking about here. So the strategy is for digital data and technology to improve the workings of government. Crucially and most relevantly, you know, it's been recognized that data is the most important part of this. So that's a bit of wider context for you. 
And standards and assurance is a really key part of this. So it's really easy to focus on the exciting and the sexy things like artificial intelligence, automation, application of data science. But what we really need to do is start focusing more on those underpinning issues, those problems with things like data. You know, none of these pillars are entirely exclusive of each other, but we need to address these in turn to deliver that third mission in the national data strategy. So what we're looking at specifically, you know, at this point is standards and assurance mission two. And I want to talk a little bit about this data standards that matter. Why do they matter? Well, we need to, you know, agree rules by which data is described and recorded across government. That's something that we've, you know, been needing to do for a long time. They're, they're, they're not glamorous, but they help organizations share, exchange, understand data, and ultimately publish data in, in open formats that's actually useful. So the Data Standards Authority, I want to talk a bit about this. So the DSA is a very new team. It's funded in the spring budget last year, so it's not even a year old. I guess it's coming up to a year old now. Uh, the first staff joined in the summer. The key aim of the DSA, the Data Standards Authority, is to improve data use and sharing in government through the implementation of standards. So, you know, we believe without meaningful standards, we can't really have meaningful data exchange and interoperability. So it's a small team for now, but we're working really hard to kind of address this issue that's always existed. We also have a sister agency, the Government Data Quality Hub, based at the Office for National Statistics. Um, they work to improve the quality of government data and best practice in the area. So, you know, really foundational stuff like data quality, data standards to help build trust in the data that we're using. Um, they released a new framework for data quality, quality management in December. Um, and I recommend actually having a look at it. I think it's available through gov.uk and I'll circulate links after this uh, conversation. So how the DSA works. So what we're trying to do is use existing and open standards wherever possible. So we're not looking to reinvent the wheel. We need to identify and address user needs with real world situations and use cases. We need to kind of, you know, explain in a plain English way what we're trying to do with these standards. We need to work collaboratively with experts from across sectors as well. So this isn't just about government marking its own homework. We need to talk to experts externally and understand what the best industry practices are in this space. Again, openness and transparency is key to what we're doing here. We need to be clear, we need to blog about this, we need to speak openly about what we're doing. And then finally, meaningful and measurable change is really important. So that is a big component. And you know, answering that question that came up in the chat earlier, really key to us to be able to kind of explain and evaluate properly what we're doing in this space. So we're looking to set and assure standards, set direction through cross-government policies, develop capabilities, give expert advice, drive continuous improvement, and where required, develop and deliver services. And so the main priority areas in order for us to do this are here. So we have APIs, metadata, identifiers, reference data, data sharing governance, refresh, and data formats. So we have a steering board that will be working with us to enable these things. Uh, there are a number of things that we've already started to write about. So the API catalog is actually now available online. That's been going at a great pace. And uh, more information around metadata and identifiers are actually going to be blogged about and have been blogged about in recent times as well. So again, gov.uk will have all of that information. Finally, that's a little bit about what we've done, a little bit about what we're doing. Finally, the way we're doing it is really important as well. So engagement, right? Transparency goes beyond just open data and publishing information and data standards, but it also extends into the ways that we engage with citizens. And so our open government policy work really takes the technical elements of data release and also develops it into further public commitments around things like behavior change and citizen impact. So I wanted to quickly touch on this, the, the principles of open government that we are holding you know, as underpinning all the work that we do, transparency, you know, people should be able to easily locate, understand and use information about government activities. We should be ensuring full transparency of actions, process and data and information should be published in complete, open, understandable, easily accessible and free formats. So that's something that we're always working on. Participation, people should be able to influence, develop, contribute to, monitor and evaluate government activities wherever possible. And governments should enable, promote and accept the participation of citizens in decision making processes where appropriate. And then finally, accountability, you know, the public should be able to oversee and control the decisions and actions taken by government where appropriate and its officials in order to guarantee that government initiatives meet the stated objectives and respond to the needs of people. So those are the principles that we hold under the work that we're delivering. We have uh, some examples of some of the work we've done in recent years around uh, transparency and participation. So I mentioned the grants data earlier. There's also the open contracting data that we've been working on. So there's a, a green paper that, that recently finished its consultation period that talks about a lot of open data measures. There's the national, national natural resource transparency work that we've been delivering through formerly DFID, now FCDO, around creating standards for the publication of extractive data, really important. 
And we've been looking at trying to refresh some of the local transparency measures as well for public data, public data release at the local level across the country. We've also created a, a, a bit of a resource to go along with this work, which we highly recommend to other public sector workers and also others, if, if you're interested. Uh, the Open Government Playbook is a way of kind of, in a plain English way, helping us, I guess, live these values in the work that we do. So what this is is a guide. It started with growing interest in the agenda and people were asking us, how do we incorporate these principles into the work that we're doing? And so we created these one pages that you can find on gov.uk. They're quite easy and short. They're all about kind of applying different approaches to different stages of the decision-making process. And they focus on those core themes of transparency, accountability, and public participation. So again, uh, I will circulate links to those afterwards. So a little bit about just some current activity. I talked a bit about what we're doing, what we're planning, the things that we're really kind of looking at in detail at the moment. We mentioned, you know, we're exploring the development of an appropriate and effective mechanism to deliver transparency on the use of algorithms. That's something that we've committed to. So an algorithmic transparency piece that's in the national data strategy around facilitating semi-autonomous decision-making within the public sector. So that's one thing. I've already talked about this at length, but the Data Standards Authority is obviously coming along and is developing more and more work all the time. We've also published these three documents, which I would again highly recommend, the Open Government Playbook, as I mentioned, the Data Ethics Framework, which is again a really important document for us to make sure that we're doing data in the right way. And then finally, the API catalog recently launched as part of the Data Standards Authority. Highly recommend checking that out as well. And the biggest one of all, the National Data Strategy, which kind of encompasses all the work that we're doing and kind of explains all the different missions, uh, goes beyond just the domestic, but also the international as well. So that was my presentation. Um, I hope that was useful. Let's see if I can come off. Great. That was great. Thank you, Sam. Um, we do have some questions in the chat, which I will come to. Um, but as ever, first I will ask one of my own. Um, in particular, what you're saying about data exchange and um, trying to convince governments to a uh, government departments to a share data more openly, uh, and also b to share more data with each other, even if it's not fully open. You know, it's a spectrum, so that's okay. Um, I think one of the big uh, forces that departments feel is fear of um, being shown to be misusing data. Um, even, you know, regardless of whether, like, what they've been doing is kind of legally proper, there's, there's always the Daily Mail effect, I suppose. How do we combat that from someone in your position in the centre? How, how, how do we kind of make that fear smaller? So, fantastic question. Um, <laughs> Sorry. One, yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Simon. And one that I'm, you know, I, can, I can't fully answer, but I guess, I guess it's been a difficult thing and it's always existed, right? It's been a big prohibitor to the work that we've done in the past and it's something that, that will never truly go away. I think there is, a, there is a, an approach that we're taking now, which is around kind of, you know, supporting departments, you know, really having a kind of a central, a central function. I didn't mention it in my presentation, but there is the new uh, central digital and data office that's being that's being kind of set up at cabinet office, which you've, you've seen, you know, that's a public, that's on public record now. There are new governance structures basically going into place to help, I think, mitigate as much as possible that feeling of, you know, being out on a limb and publishing data that then shows you up or, or is embarrassing in some way or is kind of, you know, creating a chilling effect on the kind of data that can be released. So we're, we're doing what we can to, I, I think, kind of reconfigure the way that, that we operate, reconfigure this kind of, I guess, slightly hierarchical, slightly um, siloed sort of approach and, and, and looking at more of a, a, an overall government approach. And, and I think that that hopefully will start to kind of move the dial a bit on some of those data sets that you kind of reference. Um, obviously, I can't say much more than that because we'll, we'll have to wait and see, but that's the kind of approach that we have. and. All of this is again, you know, written out in the national data strategy. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, lots of great questions in the chat. Uh, I'll come to Mary, Susan, Barry first, and I think this is quite timely because I think that um, automation is something that government is looking at a bit more widely at the moment. Um, could improved autom improved automation within government improve data quality? I think it's a case by case thing, but but you know, having worked with with um, you know the data science team in the past, I, I see uh, Bill Roberts has, has put a question in here for me. Uh, reminds me of the reproducible analytical pipelines work that um, you know the, the team with with Matt Upson uh, looked at a few years ago. I think a lot of that work 
um, shows that actually, yes, that's the case. You know, if you, if you can automate a process, if you can create pipelines, things that kind of remove the human uh, error element, I think, then you can improve data quality. But it is, again, case by case. And I think the the, the danger of, 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 of becoming too automated is, again, you know, data is narrative and putting data out there enables, you know, a number of different takes to be to be had. I think that there is a also a need for a kind of a human oversight to ensure that, you know, the data that's being pushed out there is being represented in the correct ways. And I think that's something that is, is, is never going to go away. That goes for, you know, uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, data, I think, for the most part. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, Adam, in the chat has got a good point as well, which is yeah. there is pretty clear guidance, which says, uh, you know, there's been a number of open standards for a, for a number of years now, um, which say, you know, don't use doc format, um, yeah. don't use PDFs, use open document formats. Why is it that government, despite having clear guidance on that, struggles to, yeah. to change some of those areas where that's still used? It's a great question. I think that you'd find different uh, reasons for that in different places. Um, but I think, again, it speaks to this siloed issue that we uh, just talked about. So I think I think the problem the problem is that, you know, it, it, in my view, getting data out there is, is the key thing here. Right. If you can publish the data, then you, then you should publish the data. I think that absolutely we should be publishing things in open formats and, and, and you know, where possible, machine readable and, and, you know, as useful as possible. But where there isn't the capability, where there isn't the kind of the, the skill or the or the level of, of of understanding to be able to do that, that shouldn't necessarily stop us from publishing data in whatever formats can be put out. I mean, I think it's a really good point, and it's something that we are looking to again address. Um, you know, this is what I was talking about several times in the presentation around leverage. You know, we need to be able to enforce those ways of working and. That's something that we struggled with in the past because we haven't had that central function to do so. And I, I feel that's something that we're working towards now. And hopefully that will start to uh, remedy as time goes on. Yeah, and actually on that point, I guess one of the one of the other questions I had was spend control obviously is a massive lever. I guess it's a massive stick to a certain extent. Um, what what carrots do you think there are that can be offered or can be kind of shown to um, to different departments that it's possible to say, hey, look, if you do this data stuff well, this is what you get. I think the carrot is 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 is, is the, it depends on the on the role, but I think I think from my experience, the thing that you know, particularly when it comes to things like you know, reproducible pipelines and things that of, of that nature, is that the effective data sharing and effective kind of uh, you know data collection, storage, and sharing methods actually result in in a better outcomes, which we should all be driven by, right? I mean, that's why we're here to try and deliver better outcomes for citizens. But it also just makes our jobs easier, right? I can't tell you the amount of time that I've seen analysts spend having to kind of manually work backwards through you know statistical releases or or, or evaluations. You know, if we can work in a way that, that that kind of we are keeping to these higher standards, then it means that we can more easily develop and deliver that kind of that kind of output in, in a way that doesn't require a huge amount of backtracking and, and manual kind of uh, editing. So I think, you know, that that that, I guess, case study will probably apply to many different roles in many different ways. But I think across all those things, you know, trustworthiness of the information, trustworthiness of the data, confidence in its use, you know, all of those things will will, will kind of be a, a, a byproduct of, of having that better approach. So, yeah. Uh, and Ant has put a, uh, a a fair point in the chat, a good question, which is that um, government needs to be more agile, evolving standards. Do you think, well, one, how is DSA engaging with industry? Two, kind of my extension to that is, how do you set standards in the center while still allowing people at the bleeding edge to kind of iterate? Great question. I guess um, so. In terms of the iteration, I think it's again, it's a, it, it's about knowing the right balance. It's about knowing how how much to 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 enforce and how how not to uh, enforce. I think you know that again is something that we're still working through. The landscape is extremely extremely dense, uh, as 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 you're aware. You know, it's 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 a it's a jungle. So we're trying to work through you know all the different use cases. In terms of like engaging with 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 uh, with industry, you know, it's it's something that we're we're looking at all the time. So again. 
there are different domains, there are different kind of standards associated with different types of data and different approaches. And so that's something that, again, is a case by case thing. Um, you know, the one thing I would say about all these, I can't speak at length about these for now, because as I say it's a small team that's gathering, gathering pace. But what I will say is we will be talking about this openly. We'll have blogs on these type of activities and, you know, people like myself and others will come to these events and, and, and explain to all of you the, the work that we're doing. So, you know, I think I think there's a lot more to see, there's a lot more to do, um, but we'll be doing it in a way that will hopefully uh, answer all those questions of yours as time goes on, if that makes sense. And the final question from, from Bill Roberts, uh, and this, again, something very close to my heart. Um, where is the government going with standard identifiers and reference data? And he, um, he quite rightly points out the demise of WK registers and the sort of the reference data guidance that's come in its place. So I guess the what's the direction of travel? It's again a great question. It's something that we are still kind of uh, working through. So um, I think although the, the 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 registers program, as you say, is is kind of uh, has been kind of moved to the side, it, it isn't. The concept is still something that I think uh, is is relevant in some cases. So again you know this is not the, the the idea behind registers the idea behind unique identifiers or standard identifiers within reference data these kind of things they're not going away um they may present in different ways um but they may they may look slightly different as we go forward so again i think that the idea of the registers program was was you know the right the right approach in a way to trying to uh, create those kind of standard definitions. I think that this renewed focus on things like metadata, uh, you know, ensuring that we have kind of joined up um, descriptors for data, you know, that that in a way will, will hopefully in the long term facilitate the same kind of uh, same kind of approach, but in a, I guess, in a more targeted way. So again, it's something that we're looking at. It's something that we're, we're kind of going to be developing over time. And, you know, we'll, we'll have more to say in, in the coming months, I'm sure. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh